Welcome to Five Books for Catholics, where an expert selects and explains five outstanding books in some aspect of Catholic life, doctrine, or culture. The Memorial of Our Lady of the Rosary is celebrated on the 7th of October in the general Roman calendar. Moreover, for the last 140 years, the Catholic Church has consecrated October to the Holy Queen of the Rosary. During October, therefore, we might want to do some spiritual reading on praying the Rosary. The most authoritative writings on the subject are the papal bulls and letters on the Rosary. These go back to St. Pius V. In them, the popes exhort the faithful to pray the Rosary on account of its manifold efficacy. They teach that it secures Mary's intercession, unites us to Christ and his mysteries, strengthens Christian life, builds up the church, and transforms society. Here is Five Books for Catholics' selection of the five most representative papal documents on the Rosary. There is a further reason to take these papal exhortations to heart this year. During October, Pope Francis is holding the first session of the Synod on Synodality. That is certainly a motive to pray the rosary more fervently this month and entrust the Church to Mary's care. St. Pius V was Pope from 1566 to 1572. He is the one responsible for the consolidation and spread of the rosary in its current form. No other papal document in the rosary has had a greater impact than his 1569 bull Consfavorunt Romani Pontifices. First, the Hail Mary, in its current form, was consolidated during his pontificate. The Hail Mary had developed out of liturgical antiphons that juxtaposed Gabriel's salutation of Mary during the Annunciation with Elizabeth's during the Visitation. The invocation in treating the Mother of God to intercede for our sinners was added later on. The Roman Catechism, published at the beginning of Pius V's pontificate, approves of this addition to the Hail Mary and explains why it is appropriate. It thereby endorses the current form of the Hail Mary, the earliest written records of which date back to late 15th century Italy. This version of the Hail Mary was established definitively across the Catholic world when it was included in the first edition of the Roman Breviary, issued under Pius V in 1568. One year later, Pius V established and spread throughout the whole Church the current form of the Rosary. He did so in the bull Consfoverunt Romani Pontifices. There, he endorsed the Dominican method of praying the Rosary and exhorted the faithful to adopt this pious practice. He explains that the Rosary, or Psalter of the Blessed Virgin Mary, consists of both vocal and mental prayer. It consists of vocal prayer in that the Blessed Virgin Mary is venerated by the angelic greeting, that is, the Hail Mary, repeated 150 times, that is, according to the number of the Davidic Psalter, and by the Lord's Prayer with each decade. It consists of mental or contemplative prayer in that, and here I once again I quote Pius V, interposed with these prayers are certain meditations, showing forth the entire life of our Lord Jesus Christ, thus completing the method of prayer devised by the fathers of the Holy Roman Church. The bull goes on to reflect on the origin and social import of the rosary, two themes to which subsequent papal documents will turn time and again. Pius V reports that St. Dominic adopted an already existing devotion and spread it to combat the Albigensian heresy. 300 years later, Leo XIII goes even further and claims that St. Dominic was the first to devise this new method of prayer, to use Leo's words. Such stories about St. Dominic give the rosary, no doubt, a more glamorous and saintly origin but they only began to circulate 250 years after his death. They embellish extravagantly upon an underlying historical fact. 
the Dominicans were the main promoters of the rosary. However, the rosary developed over several centuries and through various channels, as John Paul II acknowledges at the beginning of his apostolic letter, Rosarium Virginis Mariae. In Consperverunt Romani Pontifices, Pius V initiates a second thread that runs through later papal teachings on the Rosary. He stresses the importance of praying the Rosary for the reform of the Church and society. He teaches that by entreating Mary's intercession through the Rosary, the faithful will combat heresy, secure peace and convert sinners. No doubt one of the wars Pius V was thinking about when he issued the bull was the ongoing conflict between Christian princes of Europe and the Ottoman Empire. Indeed, in the run-up to the Battle of Lepanto, he called on the faithful to pray the Rosary. Little wonder then that he attributed the Holy League's victory on Sunday the 7th of October 1571 to the Blessed Virgin and instituted the Feast of Our Lady of Victory in Rome to thank her for her intervention and commemorate the Rosary. In 1573, Gregory XIII changed the name of the feast to Our Lady of the Rosary and authorised that it could be celebrated in any church with an altar dedicated to her. He set it for the first Sunday of October. In 1913, Pius X switched it back to 7th of October to give priority to the Sunday cycle. At any rate, St. Pius V is the one responsible for the current memorial of Our Lady of the Rosary. For the whole, for the, he is thereby responsible for the consecration of the whole month of October to Our Lady of the Rosary. The one directly responsible is Leo XIII in Supremi Apostolatus Officio from 1883. This is the first of his 12 encyclicals on the Rosary. The idea of dedicating October to praying the Rosary originated with the Spanish Dominican priest, José Peralta y Márquez. He wished to boost the life of his parish with more Marian devotion. May offered one occasion to do so, but he wanted another month-long rally of Marian prayer. October was the most obvious candidate. It was the month with a feast dedicated to a well-established and widely practiced Marian prayer, the Rosary one that could be held in common more frequently in the parish over the course of a month. Hence, the idea of dedicating October to praying the Rosary. Peralta and Marquez asked his confrere, Father José María Morán, to write a tract in support of this initiative. In that book, The Month of the Rosary, The Month of October, Mes del Rosario, or Mes de Octubre, from 1866, he made an appeal to the Spanish Episcopate to institute this practice across the country. They liked the idea and implemented the initiative. Leo XIII also liked the idea and in Supremi Apostolatus Officio, an encyclical from 1883, decreed that October of that year be consecrated to the Holy Queen of the Rosary and the Rosary celebrated solemnly in parishes across the Catholic world. The following year, Leo issued another encyclical on the Rosary, Superiori Anno, and made this practice an enduring custom. Leo went on to issue ten more encyclicals on the Rosary, all except one in the run-up to October. Moreover, he did not envisage the Rosary simply as a means of personal spiritual growth. Rather, his encyclicals in the Rosary are one apiece with his major documents on social teaching. Nowhere is this more apparent than in Supremi Apostolatus Officio from 1893. Near the beginning of this encyclical, Leo makes it clear that this letter on the Rosary is what we would now call a social encyclical. Here is a paragraph from near the beginning of the encyclical. We are convinced that the rosary, if devoutly used, is bound to benefit not only the individual, but society at large. No one will do us the injustice to deny 
that in the discharge of the duties of the Supreme Apostolate, we have laboured with God's help. And we shall ever continue to labour to promote the civil prosperity of mankind. Indeed, we have admonished those who are invested with sovereign power that they should neither make nor execute laws except in conformity with the equity of the divine mind. On the other hand, we have constantly besought citizens who are conspicuous by genius, industry, family or fortune to join together in common counsel and action to safeguard and to promote whatever would tend to the strength and well-being of the community. Only too many causes are at work in the present condition of things to loosen the bonds of public order and to withdraw the people from sound principles of life and conduct. As I mentioned, this paragraph shows how Leo conceives his writings in the Rosary and his promotion of the Rosary as part of a wider program to reform society. Leo goes on to identify three attitudes that, in his view, are prevalent and doing most harm to the common good of countries. These are, first, a distaste for a modest, laborious life, second, repugnance to suffering, and third, forgetfulness of the future life. As a remedy, Leo proposes the Rosary. Each set of mysteries helps us overcome one of these socially destructive attitudes. The joyful mysteries make us appreciate the value of a simple life and hard work. The sorrowful mysteries help us overcome our unwillingness to suffer. The glorious mysteries make us mindful of the future life we should hope for. Both Pius V and Leo XIII wrote their briefs in the Rosary against the backdrop of the Council of Trent. Moreover, Leo wrote his in the wake of the French Revolution and in response to modern secularisation. The next two papal documents, on the other hand, situate the Rosary within the liturgical and pastoral reforms of the Second Vatican Council. St. Paul VI's apostolic exhortation, Mariali Scultus, is not on the Rosary as such, but on the veneration of the Blessed Virgin Mary. He considers Marian devotion in the light of the Vatican II's teachings on the Church and the liturgy. As a result, he proposes some principles for a renewal and aggiornamento of Marian devotion. In the final part of the document, he turns his attention towards the Rosary. He stresses that the Rosary is a deeply contemplative, Christ-centered prayer that is rooted in sacred scripture. However, his main contribution consists in specifying its relation to the liturgy. Paul VI teaches that the rosary must neither be included among the liturgical rites, nor disregarded in favour of the liturgy. Here is the paragraph where he specifies its relation to the liturgy. Liturgical celebrations and the pious practice of the rosary must be neither set in opposition to one another, nor considered as being identical. The more an expression of prayer preserves its own true nature and individual characteristics, the more fruitful it becomes. Once the preeminent value of liturgical rites has been reaffirmed, it will not be difficult to appreciate the fact that the rosary is a practice of piety which easily harmonizes with the liturgy. In fact, like the liturgy, it is of a communitarian nature. It draws its inspiration from sacred scripture and is oriented towards the mystery of Christ. The commemoration of the, in the liturgy and the contemplative remembrance proper to the rosary, although existing on essentially different planes of reality, have as their object the same salvific events wrought by Christ. The former presents anew, under the veil of signs and operative in a hidden way, the great mysteries of our redemption. The latter, by means of devout contemplation, recalls these same mysteries to the mind of the person praying, 
and stimulates the world to draw from them the norms of living. Once this substantial difference has been established, it is not difficult to understand that the rosary is an exercise of piety that draws its motivating force from the liturgy and leads naturally back to it, if practiced in conformity with its original inspiration. It does not, however, become part of the liturgy. In fact, meditations on the mis- meditation in fact, meditation on the mysteries of the rosary by familiarizing the hearts and minds of the faithful with the mysteries of Christ can be an excellent preparation for the celebration of those same mysteries in the liturgical action and afterwards for continuing our recollection of them throughout the day. However, it is a mistake to recite the rosary during the celebration of the liturgy, though unfortunately this practice still persists here and there. End of the quotation. Although Paul VI is mainly concerned with centering Marian devotion around the liturgy, he too touches upon the rosary's importance within society. Society in the church, he notes, grow out of the family. Their health depends on the spiritual health of the families that make them up. However, a family needs to pray in common to be in good spiritual health and take on the character of a domestic church. Ideally, Christian families should pray some of the liturgy of the hours in common. Otherwise, the rosary should be considered as one of the best and most efficacious prayers in common that the Christian family is invited to recite. Perhaps no Pope has it been so strong a Marian devotion as St. John Paul II. His papal coat of arms represented Our Lady at the foot of the cross. Equally Marian was his papal motto, Totus Tuus. It evoked a prayer from St. Louis-Marie Guignon de Montfort's True Devotion to Mary. In paragraph 233 of that work, the saint proposes the following prayer. I am all thine, and all I have is thine, O most loving Jesus, through Mary, thy most holy mother. Moreover, at the beginning of his pontificate, John Paul II described the rosary as his favourite prayer. Often, he could be seen praying it intensely. Indeed, his testimony was his most compelling teaching about the rosary. However, there was also his 2002 apostolic letter, Rosarium Virginis Mariae. It was written to commemorate the 120th anniversary of Leo XIII's first encyclical on the rosary and to encourage the celebration of a year of the rosary. It is the most comprehensive papal document on the rosary and explores all its various aspects. However, like John Paul II's Episcopal motto, it is informed by the spirituality of St. Louis-Marie Guignon de Montfort. The Apostolic Letter in number 15 quotes this saint's teaching on how devotion to Mary brings us to our end, conformity and union with Christ. True Devotion to Mary, paragraph 120. Rosarium Virginis Mariae speaks of conformity 11 times. Hence, it focuses on the rosary as a means of conformity with Christ through Mary. The rosary brings about this conformity with Christ by contemplating his mysteries under Mary's tutelage. To this end, Rosarium Virginis Mariae encourages the inclusion of a new quintet of mysteries in the rosary, the mysteries of light. Each one is a key mystery from Christ's public ministry. They are meant to ensure that the rosary might truly function as a compendium of the gospel. And that is a phrase that goes back to Pius XII's Filipinas Insulas of 1946. This initiative has made the rosary more spiritually enriching. Nevertheless, there is a drawback. As John Paul II was aware, increasing the number of Hail Marys recited from 150 
to 200, undermines the rosary's symbolic connection to the Psalter and the liturgy of the hours. However, he believes that this increase in Christological depth outweighs the loss of this symbolic connection to the liturgy of the hours. In his defence, it is worth noting that the linguistic barriers to praying the liturgy of the hours that gave rose to the rosary in the first place no longer exist. The rosary originally developed as a substitute for monks who did not know the Latin needed to pray the hours. Nowadays, Latin Rite Catholics can pray the Liturgy of the Hours in the vernacular. The Rosary's symbolic connection to the Psalter is no longer as necessary or important. Rather, as Paul VI stressed, the Rosary supports the Liturgy by preparing us for the celebration of Christ's mysteries and keeping our mind fixed in them. John Paul II's inclusion of the Mysteries of Light strengthens this liturgical role of the Rosary. Summing up, these five papal documents on the Rosary remind us that the Church depends primarily on God's action, not ours. For this reason, we must rely primarily on grace, not our own efforts, on the liturgy, not our initiatives, on prayer rather than praxis, on the mother of the Church rather than on its sinful members. These papal documents are eloquent expressions of the Marian dimension of the Church. At the same time, they are a perfect example of what Benedict XVI called the hermeneutic of reform. There is remarkable continuity in the teaching of these papal documents on the Rosary. Later popes might stipulate a slight change or stress a certain aspect. But all the later teaching is already present in Pius V's 1589 bull. This October, it's well worth reading these documents or going through them once more. Better still, take up your beads and pray the rosary. Thank you for listening. To gain full access to our archive, visit fivebooksforcatholics.com and become a premium subscriber. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast and give it a top rating on the platform of your choice. That way, more people can discover it. You can also support the podcast and help us produce more interviews like this one by making a one-off donation via the link given in the show notes. As little as one dollar, one pound or one euro can help and will be greatly appreciated. Thank you once again and God bless.